Good morning. I'm Pastor Allen. Thanks so much for gathering with Fellowship Church today. Hey, if there's any way that we can be of help to you in these times, I'd invite you to click the link below and fill out a Connect card. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. I pray that this service this morning would be an encouragement and a help to you today. Blessings upon you. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday worship. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction and out of the miry bog. He set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, as we come together to worship this morning, we continue to put our trust and our faith in you. We look to you for our security, that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, that our feet would be secure on you as our rock, even as the world shifts around us. Father, put a new song in our hearts and on our lips this morning, that those around us would see and hear and place their trust in you. May the name of Jesus be glorified in us and through us this morning. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Blessed we shall be at last. 
Good morning, Fellowship Church. Hope you're well. It's a privilege to pray with you this morning. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we, your people, could come to you. As we come before you, Lord, let us take time to confess silently our sins against you, God, and against one another. Hear these words of assurance from God's word, Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our sins from us. Now as recipients of God's mercy, let us pray individually for our church, our community, and our world. I invite you next to pray at home for God's blessing and protection upon the people of fellowship. Let us now pray for God's blessing and protection upon our friends and our neighbors. Let us now pray for God's healing upon our nation and our world. Heavenly Father, we bring all our prayers to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Hey, good morning again. It's good to be with you by whatever means God allows. And uh, hey, today we're jumping back into our series in Revelation. And so our text today is Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. Now before we jump back in there, I want to give us a little background of where we've been, because it's been a few weeks since we talked about Revelation if you remember, we left off in Revelation where God was clearing out all evil from the world. He had cleared out the beast and the Antichrist and all the wicked people. And God had cleared away sort of all the evil in the world in order to bring us something new. And in chapter 21, that is where we find ourselves. God is bringing us something new. And so let's look at Revelation 21 verses 1 through 8 together. The Apostle John writes concerning the vision that God gave him. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. 
The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that these words are nothing without your Holy Spirit leading and guiding us today. And so we come and ask you that by your Holy Spirit, you would open our heart and our mind to all that you have to say. We pray that your words would nourish our souls and feed us, we pray. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this last week, I've been watching the news, and it's pretty clear a lot of people want to move on past this virus. A lot of people are sort of done with quarantines, done with the restrictions, and they would love to see a new day when this whole thing is behind us. And even if you feel differently about the quarantines and the restrictions, likely you and I are both, we're still looking forward to a, a new day when all of this is behind us. Because that's what crisis does. It makes us long for something new. When we're in a time of crisis, we long for a new season, a new world, a new life where everything is better than it is right now. But here's the thing. Today it's the coronavirus. Tomorrow it will be something different, something else. Hopefully not another virus, but, but something's coming. War, political strife, another kind of sickness or disease, some sort of economic collapse. Who knows? But we do know that something in the future will happen again that will feel like a crisis and that will make us long for another new and better time. But here's the problem. Each crisis reminds us that although you and I can do a lot of good for our world, and we should, each crisis still reminds us that we are very limited in our ability to make the world a new and perfect world forever. Each crisis reminds us that this is something we simply cannot do. But thankfully, God can do this. And thankfully, this is something God promises to do. In our text today, we see God promised that one day he will make all things new forever. And today, I want to look at God's promise to make all things new. And I want to look at how believing God's promises, these promises, can make you and me new today. And so let's dive into this and look at God's promises together. The promise for something new. First, we see God's promise to us is a new reality. God promises us a new reality. In Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle John, in his vision, he sees the, re the arrival of a new reality. Look at verse 1 again with me. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. So John sees the arrival of a new heaven and a new earth. And the word here for new, it means new in quality or character. It doesn't necessarily mean new in time. God is making a new kind of heaven, a new kind of earth. And in the Bible, when heaven and earth are put together like that, it means the totality of reality. It's referring to everything that exists, spiritual world, physical world, it's everything. And that's why John also sees that the first heaven and the first earth have now passed away. What's he seen? He's seen the old character of heaven, the old character of earth, the old character of the reality as we now know it. It's passing away. It's making way for a new reality to come. And at this point, it's not clear what all this means. But John knows already that whatever it means, it's going to be something very good. Because in John's vision, he's told the sea disappears. Now, why is that such a big deal? 
Well, if you've been with us in Revelation, you know that the sea is often in Revelation and in other places in the Bible, the sea is often a symbol for evil. Or sometimes the sea symbolizes a picture where evil dwells. It's a little like today. Uh, we, in our day, have myths about, say, the Loch Ness Monster who lives in the sea. Or if you've seen the movie The Little Mermaid, you know that there's a character, character Ursula. She's a witch who lives in the sea. And so even in our day, we kind of have this sense that the depths of a sea is kind of a dark and eerie place and maybe full of evil things. It was like that in John's day, but much more. And so in John's vision, when he sees that the sea is disappearing, it's a symbol that evil is disappearing. All evil things will be no more, which meant in this new heaven and new earth, this new reality, it was going to be a reality without evil without evil people who do what is evil. Instead, the new heaven and the new earth would be a new and perfect reality, a new world. And this is what John sees in verse 2. He says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So John sees this new reality. It's like a holy city, it's a new Jerusalem. It's a city that comes out of heaven from God. Now this new city is the opposite of an old city we saw before in Revelation. It's in opposite or in contrast to the city of Babylon. If you remember in Revelation, Babylon was a city that symbolized the kingdom of the world. Babylon was a symbolic city that, that symbolized a kingdom full of people in rebellion to God. Here in Revelation 21, we now see the opposite of Babylon. It's the new Jerusalem. It's a God's holy city. It's God's kingdom. It's a symbol of God's holy kingdom full of people who are loyal to God. People who have been saved by God. People who love God. In chapter 21, this is the first promise God makes to his people. A new reality is coming. A new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, a new world full of people who are loyal to God because they have been saved by God and they love God. Now, what does this first promise mean for you and for me today? Well, at the very least, it means that even in the midst of yours and mine not so great reality, we can still look forward to God's new reality to come. It means that you don't have to give in to the despair of your day. It means that even now, you and I don't have to believe that this current reality is all that there is or all that will ever be. No, we can believe and know that God has something new and better for you and for me. But of course, the question is, how can you and I experience this new reality that God has for us? Well, God's word is very clear that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away, the new has come. Notice how similar that language is to Revelation. Because God is saying that when you give your life to Jesus Christ today, God, even today, brings his new reality to you. In other words, every time you and I, we come in faith to Jesus Every time you and I follow Jesus, God is making you and me new. God makes your reality new today and also prepares you for the new reality to come. And so even today, in the midst of our not-so-great reality, the best thing that you and I can do to experience God's new reality and to prepare for the new reality to come is to come in faith to Jesus to come to Jesus and to pray, Jesus, Son of God, make me a new creation. Today, Jesus, Son of God, make me my reality new today. Jesus, Son of God, make me someone who looks forward and is prepared for your new reality, that new heaven and new earth, that new Jerusalem. You see, when we come to Jesus in this way, God promises to make us new. And God promises 
to prepare you and me for his new perfect reality to come. Well, we see a second promise in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 21. God promises us a new relationship. So we have a new reality and now a new relationship. In verses 3 and 4, God promises us a new kind of relationship specifically with him. Look at verse 3 with me. It says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. So John, in his vision, he hears this loud voice from the throne of heaven, and it says, Behold, God's dwelling place is with man. Now, the key word or phrase in this text is dwelling place, because the dwelling place, it refers to God's holy sanctuary that's in heaven. It's the place where God dwells. And in the Old Testament, God had promised his people that one day that heavenly holy sanctuary would come to earth. And so we read in Ezekiel 37, verses 26 through 28. Listen to these words. The prophet Ezekiel said, or the Lord said through the prophet Ezekiel, I will make a covenant of peace with them. That's my people. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So you see, in Revelation 21, John is seeing the fulfillment of this day that was promised back to Ezekiel and the people of Israel. John is seeing this day when God brings his holy sanctuary to earth to dwell among his people. And we see that when God does this, a new kind of relationship begins between him and his people. Look at verse 4 of chapter 21 with me. John tells us, he says, He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So we get this picture of God dwelling with his people. He dwells with them as their God, and look at how God interacts with his people. John is told, God himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now this is a new close relationship with God. It's a deeper intimacy, a deeper relationship between God and his people. Just think about for a moment with me, who are people in your life you would allow to wipe a tear from your face? Like, whether you were having tears of sadness or tears of joy, who would you actually allow in your life to come up and just wipe that tear off your face? I don't know about you, but I can only think of one person in my life I would let do that. My wife, Meredith. If I was crying, even if I was happy crying, and somebody tried to come up and touch my face and wipe away a tear, I'd be like, get away, I'm okay, I'm okay, right? Give me my space. Now, as a child, I, I definitely would have allowed my parents to wipe my tears. But, but that's the picture here in Revelation 21. This new relationship with God and his people is so close. It's, it's like a loving relationship between trusted spouses. Or it's a new relationship with God that's so close and tender. It's like a relationship that a child would have with a good and caring parent. That's what it looks like when God's holy dwelling comes among his people in the new heaven and the new earth. There's a new, close, and caring relationship between God and his people. We see more of God's care for his people as John is told that God will remove death. He's told it shall be no more. And God himself will ensure there'll be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain anymore. For God, by God's power, these former things will have now passed away. Through John's vision, God is showing you and me a vision of something new, a new kind of reality, a new kind of close relationship with God that previously we could have only dreamed of. And yet this is the promise God offers you and me today, a day that you and I can look forward to. A day, think about this, a day when you and I won't have to wonder in the midst of suffering and tragedy and crisis, we won't have to wonder, where's God in all this? 
No, God will be in our midst. His holy dwelling will be in our midst. We will see him. We'll never have to go through a time in pain or suffering that, that distracts us away from God. We'll, we'll never have that fear of death anymore. Instead, well, there's a day coming when those who belong to God will have a new and better relationship with him, a new closeness with him. There will be new joys that come from experience, the fullness of what it means that he is our God and we are his people. But again, we don't have to wait for the future to begin such a relationship. Because in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we meet this God. In Jesus Christ, we meet the God who comforts his people even now. We meet the God who walks with us through suffering. In Jesus, we meet the God who brings us life even out of death. And you and I can be Again, to experience this new relationship with God is, again, we come to Jesus each day. Today, we come to Jesus with our tears. We come in our sufferings and frustrations. We come to Jesus even in the face of death. We come to Jesus. And we say to Jesus, Jesus, would you bring God's presence to me? Jesus, would you bring the comfort of God to me? Jesus, would you walk with me in these days? As we come to Jesus each day, even now, our closeness to God grows and grows. Our relationship with him is made new again and again, day after day, even in the midst of these crazy times. And when we come to Jesus each day in these ways, God makes us and prepares us and gives us hope for the new kind of relationship with him that is to come. And this leads us to the third way that God makes things new. God promises, promises us new rewards. God promises us new rewards. In verses 6 through 8, we see God's promise of new rewards. But before the rewards, God in verse 5 gives us a few reminders. Look at verse 5 with me real quick. John hears from God, he says, And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So John is told God is making all things new. Emphasis on the all things. Again, a new kind of reality. A new kind of relationship with God. And yet, it's like God knows that these promises and the one he's about to promise that these are actually hard for his church and his people to believe. And so John is told by God, write this all down, for these words I'm about to say are trustworthy and true. God is saying to John, he's saying to the church, he's saying to you and to me, you can trust my words, you can put your faith in what I'm about to say to you. And so now come the promise of God, the new promise of new rewards. Look at verse 6 with me. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And so God promises a reward to the thirsty. In verse 6 he says, To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Now, in the Gospel of John, John chapter 4, we see that this water of life, it's a symbol of eternal life that comes from a relationship with Jesus. You might remember the story of Jesus at the well with the woman. And in John 4.14, Jesus said, Whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. That water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so in Revelation 21, God is promising that reward of life and life eternal in and through Jesus Christ. Now, like the new reality of God, like the new relationship with God, this reward also, this reward of life with Jesus is something that you and I have access today. But if we're honest, we have to admit there are days when even as Christians, even as churchgoers, even as followers of Jesus, Jesus Christ, we have to admit there are days when you and I don't drink from the water that Jesus offers us. Maybe it's because of our own sin. Maybe we're just distracted in this crazy world. But whatever the reason, 
Although that you and I have access to Jesus, we have access to the water of life, you and I often still live as people who are parched or thirsty, right? We live as unsatisfied people. But in the new heaven and the new earth, we will always be satisfied by the water of life that comes from Jesus. On that day, we will enjoy the fullness of the water of life because there we will have the fullness of a relationship with Jesus. And in this way, this water of life will be a new kind of reward for God's people. But that is just the beginning. Next, God promises a second reward. Look at verse 7 with me. It says, The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now, all throughout Revelation, we've seen the one who conquers is the person who remains faithful to Jesus. And here, God promises, Those who remain faithful to Jesus... They will have an inheritance as a son or a daughter of God. Now again, this is a reward that even now we have in and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. For the Bible says, For all who have received Jesus and believe in his name, he gave the right to become sons and daughters of God. So if you have received Jesus, if you have believed in his name for salvation, you have this reward even now. You are an adopted son and daughter of God. But when God makes all things new, we will experience this reality, this reward in a very new way. I think about the story that Jesus told in the Gospels about the prodigal son. You might remember that story. A son leaves his father because he does not know the father's true love for him. But after squandering his life and his inheritance, the son comes to his senses, and remember, he returns to the father. And Jesus tells us that when the father saw him far off, he ran to him, and with open arms he embraced his son, and he clothed his son with a fine robe, and then threw a party for his son. And it was at that moment that the son experienced the fullness of his sonship with his father. This is the picture here in Revelation 21. Now, today, you and I who belong to Jesus, yeah, we're sons and daughters of God. But so often, we do not know the fullness of God's love for us. We do not experience the fullness of what it's like to be a son or daughter of God. But when God makes all things new, we will come to the open arms of our Heavenly Father. We will be clothed with His royal robe, and we will enjoy the party that he has for us. And on that day, the reward of being a son or daughter of God will feel very new. And that leads us to the last reward here we see in verse 8, which admittedly at first does not even seem like a reward at all. Look at verse 8 with me. It says, God says to his church, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So here God lays out this list of people that represent people in rebellion to God, wicked people. The list represents people who often lead his church astray, leads his church away from the living water of Jesus. This is a list of people that would lead his church away from experiencing the reward of being a son or daughter of God. And what does God tell his church will happen to these wicked people? God says their portion will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. In other words, this group of people will be separated from God and his people and will be held in God's judgment forever. Now again, at first, this does not seem like a reward for God's people at all. But think about what this would have meant to the church of John's day. It would have meant that there is a world coming that would be free from people sinning against God. It meant that there would be a world coming that would be free from people distracting the church, the people of God, from the life-giving close relationship with God. It meant that they could look forward to a day when God would make all things new and the world would be free from wicked people that were tempting them to sin, wicked people that were deceiving them away from the truth. The world would be free from people leading them away from all the blessings God had for them. And it meant that the church would never have to fear that these wicked people would one day get out and ruin the perfect world God had brought to earth. 
And so from this perspective, the promise of wicked people being taken away and trapped in the fire of God's judgment is very much a reward for those who love God. It's a new reward for the people of God who long to love God, to worship God, and to serve God unhindered and without distraction forever. And this, this is God's promise for his people even today. A new day is coming when all the wicked people will be gone. All those who distract and tempt the church community will be gone. And thus, we who belong to God, who have had our wickedness paid for by the cross and blood of Jesus Christ, we who have received God's mercy, we will enjoy the reward of unhindered, distraction-free, uncompromising worship and enjoyment of God forever. That is the reward for those who today drink the life-giving water of Jesus. That is the reward of those who receive Jesus and believe in his name and become sons and daughters of God. Our reward will be a perfect world with our perfect God in perfect relationship to him. And so today, you and I may long for a new season, a new life, even a new world where there's nothing imperfect, nothing evil, nothing that we don't like. But may our longing cause us to put all our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And may our longing cause us to give all our lives to God. So that today, even now, you and I would enter the reality, experience the relationship, and receive the rewards that God has for you and for me. And so that we would be prepared for and have a great hope for the new reality, new relationships, and new rewards that are to come. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to believe that your words are trustworthy and true. Sometimes as we think about the future and the new reality, the new relationship, the new rewards, it, and it almost can sound too good to be true, too hard to believe. So Lord, I pray that we would believe your words. And Jesus, I pray that we would put all our faith and trust in you today, that you would come and make us new today. Give us new hearts, give us new minds, Give us a new reality in and through you today. Lord, give us a new relationship with you today. Give us all the rewards that you have for us in and through Jesus today. And fix our eyes and give us hope for all that's coming, the something new that only you will bring, that perfect world to come. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Who 
send the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing a hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing a hallelujah, now and never we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy, when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing a hallelujah, our hope springs eternal, oh, sing Christ, our hope in life and death. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and then we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Now Christ, our hope in life and death. In this time of online church, we have the opportunity to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ like never before. And so would you help us by giving this video a like or leaving a comment or sharing it on Facebook or other social media. Thanks so much for partnering with us in the gospel. Now receive your benediction. May you enter into the new reality God has for you, enter the new relationships that God has for you, and enter and receive all the rewards that God has for you in and through his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Go in peace. Amen.